The blessing of the Lord. How many of you are believing that 2023 is going to be a year of blessing for you? We have claimed that as a promise. We really believe that God has been speaking about how he wants to bless each and every one of us this year. And so I really advise you to wake up every day and claim the promise. You know, it's very easy for us to have a promise from God. God gives us good promises, but sometimes we have to hold on to them, okay? Because if we don't hold on to God's promises, it's very easy to lose them. So I would, I would really recommend all of us wake up every day and just thank God. Thank you, God. Today is going to be a blessed day, and this year is going to be a blessed year. And what do we mean by, by blessing? I'm going to go into that a little later, but this year we believe that we are to turn up our expectations for supernatural intervention at work, at your home, and everywhere you go. And so we should be expecting good things from God this year. Get ready for doors to fling open, doors that you could never open by yourself, and watch God demonstrate his goodness in front of all who doubted the depth of his love. Watch God show how he can shower goodness on you. And we have to make God our first, second, and only option. You know, sometimes we have our own plans, but this year let's submit to God's plans for our lives because when we are in his plan, in his will, he gets to lavish his blessings on us. That's the best place to be. It's the most blessed place that we can be is in the center of his will. So God shouldn't be just part of our plan. God has to be our plan. He has to be the plan for us. So what is a blessing? A blessing is a supernatural ability to prosper despite the difficulty of the circumstances around us. It's having the wind of heaven at our backs, pushing us forward into divine destiny. So God has a destiny, an amazing destiny, an amazing purpose for each one of us. And that's what God's blessings do. They propel us into the place that he has for us. It's like having a wind pushing us instead of having a wind coming against us. And that's always been God's plan. It was always God's plan that we, his children, are blessed. And we know that with Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve were created, the very first thing that God did was to bless them. He blessed them. But Adam chose to sin. And the blessing was broken, but God had a plan. And the plan started when he gave Abraham a covenant, a promise. And that was his desire to restore blessing back on his people. Now, if you were a descendant of Abraham, if you were a Jew, you would get that blessing. But none of us here are really Jews, are we? Right? I doubt. But thank God for Jesus, because that part of the plan was only just a fraction of what God was doing. God was making the way for Jesus to come, and now Jesus is here. All we have to do is believe in him by faith, and all of us who believe in him by faith now become inheritors of his promise to bless us. So now we are all able to receive his blessing just because of Jesus. So the great thing about God's blessing is that we do not, we do not have to earn it. We don't have to work hard to earn it. But what we do have to do is make sure we don't block the blessing. We don't have to earn it, but we have to work to make sure we don't block it. You know, just, I think last weekend, we took down our Christmas tree and our Christmas decorations and our Christmas lights. And I know that's really late. There was just a lot to take down. And I was really dreading taking them down. We have a big tree and it just takes ages to get everything wrapped up again. And so we left it until late. But as I was taking everything down, I, was, I remembered how excited we were to get the tree up. And we have some lights that go around the tree. You know, the lights that we put around the tree. And I remember the, the ones that we used around our tree, they're really nice. They're white lights. But I remember almost throwing those lights away. Because when we first wrapped it around the tree, they weren't working. They weren't working. And I thought that it was broken and I would have to throw it away. But thankfully, my husband was there and he managed to fiddle a few things and the light started working and the tree looked really nice. And you know, sometimes we feel that 
God is not blessing us, that his blessing doesn't come to us, or we feel that there's something wrong with us and that we're not deserving of his blessing or that it's not for us. And those lights, you know, I thought maybe when they were broken, maybe the lights were broken. Or I thought maybe there's something wrong with the electricity. But really, it never is the case. It's never the electricity that's a problem. The electricity is flowing. The blessing is flowing. And there's nothing wrong with the lights. They're, they actually work. But there's blockages, right? It will just take one kink in the wire, and there's a blockage. And what you have to do with the lights is you have to find where that blockage is. And once you find that blockage, you kind of tweak it a bit, and then everything comes. All the lights come up. Right? So there's nothing wrong with the electricity, nothing wrong with the lights, but there's a block. And sometimes the blessing of God can be like that in our lives when we block it, when we stop it from coming. And so we've been looking over the past weeks, what are these blocks? What are the things that stop us from receiving the blessing that God has for us? As, as his children, he has blessings for us. And if, if we feel, no, not me, it's not because there's something wrong with you. You're not broken. And it's not because there's no blessing. The blessing is there. But there's a block. And so we looked at the block of unforgiveness and not being able to love well. And sometimes when we have unforgiveness in our hearts or we have a lack of love, that can block the blessing that God is trying to let flow in our lives. And so what do we do if that's the case? Well, we're, we're blessed. We have a God that we can just turn to and say, God, show me. Show me if there's anything in my heart that I need to get rid of. And so I advise us all that we go to God constantly, continually, and ask him, Lord, is there any unforgiveness in my heart? Is there anything I need to repent of? And once we do, all we have to do is repent, turn around, and that blockage goes. The second thing that can block, block us from God's blessing is running away from God's will. Just like um, Jonah. I was going to say Noah. Just like Jonah. You know, today, uh, not today, yesterday, Josh and I, Pastor Josh and I, we were in a conference, and it was called, it's called Lead Talks, and it's a place where all these young and older leaders, Christian leaders can come together, and they were just sharing their testimonies of how God has used them to be fruitful, and they were sharing their testimonies and their stories and their experiences, and every single one of them, every one of them talked about this word called purpose. And they talked about being in God's will. And what I realized was we are fruitful when we are in God's will. That's the best place for us. And, you know, God wants us in his will. And when we're not in his will, we block the blessings that God has for us. The best place that we can receive God's blessings is in the center of his will. Because God has so many blessings, so much divine help to give you, to push you into that place that he has created just for you. I want to challenge you, if you are in a place and you are waking up every morning and you're like, I don't think this is for me, or I don't know if I'm meant to be doing this, or you really hate going to work, take this year, take this time, six months, one month, a whole year, whatever, to ask God, God, is this really what you have for me? Am I in your will? And that's always a great question to ask God anyway. God, am I in your will? And allow God to reposition you back into the place that he has for you. So that was the second blockage, not being in God's will. The third blockage is when we are careless with our words. Pastor Josh talked about that last week. And he, and he talked about how sometimes we speak words of curse over ourselves instead of words of blessing. And there's power in our words. There's power in our words. I want you to do something for me. I want you to repeat after me. Can you do that? Yes, I want you to say, I am blessed in the city and in the field, in the basket and in the store. I am blessed coming in and going out. I'm the head, not the tail, above only, never beneath. The Lord is on my side. He is for me. He is fighting for me. His favor goes before me. It follows me. It surrounds me. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. Amen. 
Deuteronomy 28, that's from. If you ever want to declare that over your life, declare it because, I mean, this is not about manifesting. This is not about making us feel good and speaking words over our life and seeing things happen. This is about declaring what God says about us. This is about using his words and agreeing with what God says about us. We are blessed. It's his desire to bless us. And today we're going to look at another block, the fourth block that can happen. And that's when we allow fear into our hearts. Today, God's going to be doing some work in our hearts and he's going to be asking us, are there any pockets of fear that's in your heart? Are there any pockets of fear that in your heart? Because when we have fear in our lives, it can block the blessing. If you think about it, fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. And it will hinder the blessing from operating at its full capacity. It's almost like a cancer. You start off with a little bit of fear, and then it slowly multiplies, it grows, it gets bigger, it attacks you in different places. And we don't want to let it get hold of us. We don't want to let there be any fear. In fact, the Bible mentions the word fear around 500 times. 500 times. That means for every day of the year, there's more than one do not fear that God is saying. There's more than one do not fear. Listen to this quote. The cure for fear is not to simply try harder to not fear, but rather gaining a proper understanding of our position before God. So I'm not saying to you, fear is bad. Stop being afraid. I'm saying fear is going to not be good for you And the way that you stop fearing is to understand who you are in front of God and how you're positioned. And when you have a good understanding of that, the fear will dissolve. The fear will dissolve. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. I don't know what fears are in your mind. You know, maybe you've got a fear that you're getting older and you're not married yet. And the devil's whispering in your ear, ear, it's never going to happen. You know, I, I, I met a girl yesterday and she was telling me, that a lot of her friends are now in marriages that are not going well because they made choices to get married based on fear. They were afraid that they were getting older. Their parents were afraid. They met someone. They weren't quite sure about it, but they were afraid they weren't going to find someone better. And she said a lot of them are now in uh, really not good positions because their choices were made out of fear. You know that when we get married, we have to make decisions based on faith that God is going to show us, that God's going to confirm, he's going to give us a peace, that God has the best for us. We don't have to make those decisions out of fear. It might be that we have someone in our family who had cancer, maybe our, our father or our grandfather, and you know we're getting pains in the same parts of our body, and, we're, and we hear the devil whispering to us, the same thing's going to happen to you, and we've got that fear in our heart. Or maybe we're at work and we think that we're overlooked all the time, you know, and we've never seen any favor and and we hear the devil whisper, it's always going to be that way. Or maybe we haven't found our purpose yet and we hear the devil whisper, you're never going to find it. God doesn't have anything for you. You're useless. God doesn't have anything for you to do. We have to make sure that fear is not creeping in. And how we do that is by getting a proper understanding of our relationship with God. We understand who we're connected to, which is God, King of Kings, and how we're connected to him, and how we're connected to him. So today we're going to look at three things, three things that will help us, just say we're holding fear in our hands, will help us to drop the fear and embrace something that's much better. Okay, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to drop the fear that the enemy is giving us, all these lies that he whispers in our ears. And he wants us to take hold of the good things that he's given us in Jesus. So the first thing that he asks us to embrace, to take hold of, is sonship. Is sonship or daughtership. Romans 8 verse 15 says, So you should not be like cowering, fearful slaves, You should behave instead like God's very own children, adopted into his family, calling him Father, dear Father. I love the NLT version of it, Father, dear Father. You know, I think a child can only call a father, Father, dear Father, when they know how much the father loves them. 
And God is saying, drop this idea of being a slave and behave like children. You're a child of God. That's what the word of God says. You're a child of God. And I know that Paul in Romans 1, he calls himself a servant. Some, some uh, versions have, have the word slave. He says, Paul, a servant or slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. But when he says that, he's not saying that he's not a child of God. When he says servant, he's talking about the posture of his heart. The posture of his heart is to be a servant, is to be a slave, to do whatever God wants him to do. But he's not talking about his identity because he knows that he's a child of God. Slaves don't get an inheritance, right? The master of the house will always give the inheritance to his children. He's not going to give it to the servant or the slave. We are children of God. So the opposite to the spirit of fear is the spirit of faith. And that comes, we can have faith when we understand how God sees us, that we've been adopted into his family. It's not just that God says we belong to him. He says, you belong to me as my own precious son, my own precious daughter. That's how God sees you. That's how God sees you. And that helps us to have faith because God isn't just a father to us. He's a perfect father to us. He is a perfect father to us. So understanding that we belong somewhere and understanding who we belong to. And if we know that, if we're going to say, yeah, this is what the word of God says, I'm going to believe that, then we have to start acting like sons and daughters when we approach God. We have to start acting like sons and daughters. And the truth is that we are all God's creation. Yeah, do you agree? Every human being on this earth is God's creation, but we are not all God's children. We are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. John 1 verse 12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It says all we have to do is believe in his name, and then we become the precious sons and daughters of Christ. We just say yes to Jesus. So if you have said yes to Jesus... And you know that you are a son and daughter of the Most High God. That he looks at you and he calls you my beloved child. Then why do you live in fear just like someone who isn't a child of God? Right? We know. We know that we're children of God. But sometimes we live as if we're not. We're just a creation. I'm sure that there are lots of children of billionaires and millionaires who never think or worry about paying a bill. They don't have to worry. They don't have to think about, oh, one day maybe I won't be able to afford something because they know who their parents are. They know who their father is. But you are all children of a king, the king of kings. And that should change our perspective and that should change our expectations, our expectations of what God wants to do in us, and in our lives. It should change our expectations. The blessing is for God's sons and daughters, not for slaves. And it brings a level of confidence with it. In Luke 13, there's this account of Jesus. It's, um, it's a Sabbath. He's in the synagogue. And this woman comes in and she's bent over. She's bent over. Can you imagine how that would look? You know, I don't know if you've ever seen anyone bent over. And she, it says that she wasn't able to straighten up. I know that I've seen a few people like that, and I just think how painful, how cruel, how cruel a, a, an infirmity to have. But it says that Jesus sees her, and then he says, woman, you are healed, and instantly she's healed and she straightens up. Now imagine what would happen if that happened here. Just say someone came in, they were bent over, and they came in, and one of us, or all of us went, and we put our hands on them, and we prayed, and then they were healed. All of us would be celebrating, right? We'd be rejoicing. We'd be praising God. It'd be so wonderful. We'd be so happy, so relieved. But you know, the religious leaders were not happy. They were not happy at all. In that time, sin was associated with sickness. And so this woman didn't deserve the blessing. Plus, Jesus had healed on a Sabbath, but she didn't deserve to get healed. 
And you know, sometimes we are religious, right? We are religious in the way we think. We think that Sunday service has to be a certain way. We have to dress a certain way. There's certain things we can't say in a service. Maybe there's movies that we are not allowed to show, movie clips. And, but you know, God showed up. And when God moves, he moves. And he shows what's important. He shows what's important. He shows what he cares about and what he doesn't. But listen to how Jesus responds. Luke 13 Verses 15 to 16, Jesus says this, You hypocrites, he says, any one of you would untie your ox or your donkey from the stool and take it out to give it water on the Sabbath. Now here is this descendant of Abraham who Satan has kept in bonds for 18 years. Notice it's not God that kept this person in bondage, this woman in bondage. It was Satan. It wasn't God's will. And and Jesus says, should she not be released on the Sabbath? Now, what does Jesus say? Here is this descendant of Abraham. So he was saying this woman was healed, not because she comes to the synagogue regularly, not because of the amount she tithes, not because she serves in the synagogue, not because of what she'd done, just because she was a descendant of Abraham, who she was gave her the right, just because of her heritage, the mere fact that she was a Jew simply because she is in the line of Abraham. And that means for us, simply because we are in the family of Jesus Christ. That's why God wants to bless us, simply because we are in the family of Jesus Christ, simply because you are now a child of the Most High God. That's why he wants to bless you. And so sometimes we have to stop pleading and begging God, God, please, would you just, please, I need this. And God, you know, thinking, is he even hearing me? Does he even care? It's his desire God wants to bless you more than maybe you even want the blessing because he's a perfect father. Can we have the confidence of being children of God? Are we confident children? Are we confident children? Let me tell you about a confident child in my family. She's my daughter, Grace, my eldest daughter, and she's at boarding school at the moment, but she came home during the, the Christmas period. And, you know, we had our Christmas event and we had our uh, New Year's event and I was asking her, do you have clothes? I didn't know. She's growing very fast. She's nearly my height now. I said, do you have clothes that you need? Do you have your shoes? And she said, you know, I think I do. And then she said, but it doesn't matter anyway because if I don't, I'll just borrow yours. I was like, what? She said, yeah, mum, I'll just borrow yours because now her, you know, my clothes fit her, my shoes fit her. And I said to her, Grace, just because I'm your mum, do you think that you just have full access to my wardrobe and she said yes and I thought about it and I thought okay well you know she's right she knows I'm going to give her whatever she needs because I love her she's my child she's precious and I love her and can we be that confident when we come into our heavenly father's presence knowing that he wants to give us good things knowing that it's his desire to bless us what would happen if all of us as the body of Christ got so bold and so confident before God, just because we knew that he loves us, that we are his precious sons and daughters. How would we start to communicate with God differently? What things could we expect from him? And you know, I'm not talking about material things. I'm not talking about shoes and clothes. You know, maybe in our time of need, when we're going through something difficult, we don't have to beg and plead for his mercy and his goodness. Can we just come before him knowing that he loves us, that he cares, that he cares for all the pains that we have and and know that there's abundance of his mercy and his goodness and his grace in our times of need, that he has that for us as our perfect father. Listen to this. When you know you're a child of the king, you walk with a different level of confidence. When you know that you are a child of the king, you walk with a different level of confidence. God wants us to become confident children. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And God isn't just someone who loves us. He he isn't just a father. He is a perfect father. He is a perfect father. So that's the first thing that God wants us to do. Let go of fear and embrace our sonship or our daughtership. And the second thing that God wants us to embrace is righteousness. Embrace the righteousness that he's given us. So what is righteousness? I know sometimes even I get confused over this. 
But righteousness is the quality of having a right standing with God because of being morally right in his sight, free from sin and guilt. Now, without Jesus, let's be honest, none of us could have that. None of us could have righteousness. Not in anything that we can do. We could never earn it. We could never strive for it. There's nothing we can do to have a right standing of God. We could never be free of sin and guilt without Jesus. But sometimes we know, even when we are in Christ, we still fear his judgment. We still know what we've done. We still know our failures. And we still think, you know, I, I deserve that judgment and I deserve, you know, maybe God is angry at me or, or, you know, especially when it's things that we do over and over again, you know, God must be so disappointed. He must be so disgusted. He must be so fed up. And we don't think that we could stand before God. We don't think that we can stand before God. And that creates fear before us. We don't want to stand before him. We're afraid to stand before him. And when we do that, we block our blessing. We block our blessing because we're not able to come to him and receive what he has to give us. But what does the Bible tell us? The Bible tells us that when we have faith in Jesus, we are made righteous before God because of Jesus dying for all of our sins. He went and he took all of our sins, he died for our sins, and he made us righteous before God. Romans 4 verses 4 to 6 in the NCV says this. It says, when people work, their pay is not given as a gift but as something earned, right? All of us earning salaries, it's not a gift, right? We've worked for the money. But people cannot do any work that will make them right with God. So they must trust in him who makes even evil people right in his sight. Then God accepts their faith and that makes them right with him. David said the same thing. He said that people are truly blessed when God, without paying attention to their deeds, makes people right with himself. And so we can't earn the righteousness, but the word of God tells us we are just to believe. We are just to, just to believe, and then he gives us his righteousness. And you know, righteousness and holiness are different things, two different things. Okay? So righteousness is who we are before the throne of God, and holiness is how we conduct ourselves, how we act before the throne of God. Okay? Righteousness is who we are before the throne of God. It's to do with the identity that God has given us. And holiness is how we act before the throne of God. The Bible says we are made righteous, but the Bible also says be holy. And God wants us to do both. He wants us to embrace both. But God's ability to love you and bless you is not based on your holiness. It's based on your righteousness. It's based on your righteousness. And that's a gift from God. And we know as parents, you know, any parents here knows that it's not about what our children do that makes us love them. You know, the other day I took Hannah for um, shots. She had to have two vaccinations, one in each arm. And I thought she's going to be fine. She, She normally cries a bit and she's a bit afraid. But she was horrendous in the clinic. I was so embarrassed. She screamed. She cried. She was racing out. She never let me touch her. I couldn't even hold her to give her the injection. And we stayed there for, I swear it was about half an hour, just trying to plead with her. She was being rude to the doctor. I was so embarrassed. And she'd already got the injections out, so I'd already paid for them, and I couldn't waste it. I needed her to have them. And in the end, there had to be three people. I went out the room. There was three people that held her down, and they put one in one arm, and they put one in the other. And it was, it was horrific. And I almost thought, you know what, I'm just going to leave her there because I've had enough and I wanted to leave her. But I didn't. I didn't. You know, I love my child. But, you know, it's not because of what she does or what, what she doesn't do. Or There's nothing that can make me not love her. She's my child. And that's the same with God. That's the same with God. It's about who we are, not what we do. And we really have to think about how sometimes culture shapes our understanding of things. Because I know that sometimes we've just been told or we've heard or we've under the impression that, you know, God is looking at us to put his wrath on us. You know, that he's just waiting for us to do something wrong and then he's just going to punish us because he should punish us. And we think of God in that way, don't we? We think that he's just going to punish us and he's going to be angry or he's going to be disgusted at us. 
But we know that that's not the truth. We know that God says that Jesus has given us his righteousness. And when we have that fear, when we're like, oh, you know, I, I, I'm just too ashamed. I just can't come before God. I can't believe I, I did that. I can't believe I failed again. Instead of making us run to God, it makes us run away from God. Right? It makes us run away from him. When we feel like that, when we believe that, it makes us run away from him. And when we're running away from him, we can't come before him. And it blocks the blessing because God has so much. When we come to him in our, in our sin and in our failure, all we have to do is repent. And then he makes us clean. And there's so much more to get in his presence than there is if we run away from him. Romans 5.8 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, when God sees your sin, when God saw our sin, he didn't turn away from it. He didn't send his punishment or his wrath. He found a solution. He found a solution. He made a way. And he doesn't look at you through the filter of what you've done in the past. He came to do something about it. He came to die in our place and take away our poor standing with God forever. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Sinful man couldn't live up to God's standard. So Jesus was sent to take our place. And now when God sees us, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus' his righteousness. We've been made righteous. And we have to start believing that, believing what the word of God says. Whether you feel it or not, we have to start believing what the word of God says. Think about it. God took all of our sins, all of our sins, the bags and bags of our sins, and he dumped them on Jesus, even though Jesus had done nothing wrong. And then he took all of Jesus' righteousness, and he dumped it on us, even though probably most of us have done nothing right. Isn't that so amazing? It's almost like a bank account, you know, a bank account with our sins in it. And that transfer being made to Jesus' account. And instead, he transfers back his righteousness. And then our accounts say paid in full. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? But that's what God has done for us. That's what he has done for us. Isaiah 54, 14 says this. In righteousness, you shall be established. In righteousness, you shall be established. You are established in righteousness. What does it mean to be established. The Hebrew word used um, in Isaiah means to stand erect or perpendicular, to stand straight. And that means you're not leaning towards sin in one way or leaning, you're not a bit of this or a bit of that. You are perfectly righteous before God. Okay? And it's, uh, the, the verse continues, you shall be far from oppression for you shall not fear and from terror it shall not come near you. And then verse 17 goes on to say, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why? Why? Why does God want to bless us in this way and protect us? Because it's our heritage. It's our heritage. And he's given this to us as a gift. And we have to understand that we have been established in righteousness. The, the Apostle Paul, he had an understanding of this. I always wonder how he must have felt. Because there he was persecuting, murdering Christians at a time when they were just trying to spread the gospel. And not only did he harm and hurt people, but he also probably hindered the gospel from spreading. How did he feel when he was saved? How did he feel? He must have just felt so much guilt and so much shame. But you don't see that when he writes. He says this, 1 Timothy 1.15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He knew what he had done. But you see, we don't see his guilt in his letters, but we see his gratefulness instead. We don't see his guilt, we see his gratefulness. And he allowed that gratefulness to transform his life. 
And he gave his life to Jesus and he worked for the gospel and he didn't live in his shame and he didn't live in his guilt. And, you know, when we try to to let guilt change us, maybe it'll work for a short amount of time. But in the end, we'll find ourselves going back to our own ways. But when we let his grace and his goodness and what he's given us transform us, and it's always before us, we know that we can be changed. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 34 says this. It says, Awake to righteousness. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not, know, do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. The word that is used in that awake to righteousness is a Greek word saying eknifo, eknifo. And that means to return to oneself from drunkenness. So you're, you were drunk and then you get sober, to become sober. And so it's almost like the writer was saying, when you don't understand that God has given you his righteousness, it's almost like you're, you're drunk, you're out of your mind. And you need to wake up. You need to get your mind right and you need to understand that God has given you his righteousness. And does that mean that we keep on sinning because we have this righteousness? We can. We can, but why would we? Why would we want to? You know, when we, really, when we realize that we don't deserve his righteousness, when we realize that we didn't have to earn it, that it was given to us freely, when we, when we understand the price that was paid for the righteousness that God has given us, why would we keep Why would we want to keep on sinning when we understand that actually not only has he given us his righteousness, but he's given us dominion over sin. Now we have the power in Jesus' name to overcome sin, to resist. We don't have to run away from God in fear. We can run to God and accept his strength and and the courage and and receive his mercy to be able to defeat sin, to turn away from sin. And we can see that sin gradually have less hold on us as we keep running to God. Not in fear, but in faith that he wants to bless us and he wants to help us. The Bible says the goodness, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of God. When we get a revelation that God will love you at your worst and at your best and that he did everything he could to give you right standing with him, it means that when we make a mistake, we don't have to run away from God that we can run to him. We can run to him. We don't have to fear. We don't have to fear. So God is saying today, embrace your righteousness. Let go of your fear that he wants to judge you, that he has punishment for you, that he's disappointed and angry and ashamed. And take hold of the righteousness that he has given you. He's promised. His word says it. Take hold of the righteousness that he's given you. And allow yourself to come into his presence. And receive the good gifts, the blessings that he has for you. That's the second thing that God wants us to grab hold of is his righteousness. And the third and the final thing that God wants us to take hold of and embrace is his grace. It's his grace. 1 John 3 verse 20 and 21 says this. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings and he knows everything. Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. The truth is God will love us even when we sin. He loves us even when we sin. But sin stops us from wanting to go before God with confidence. And it makes us want to run away. It's something else that makes us want to run away from God. Listen to these facts about sin. Sin eats away at your confidence. Sin will cause you to start believing that God is going to be fed up with you. Sin will cause you to believe that the people you love are going to get fed up of you too. Sin will cause you to believe that you don't deserve to have God love you and use you. Sin will make it hard to have close ties with those who are committed to living for Christ. Sin will make you not want to come to church because you're going to think that everyone's judging you or everyone will judge you. So we run away from God and we think that he's going to punish us for our sins. But that's not what the Bible says. Instead, the Bible says we can embrace his grace. He didn't give us punishment on the cross. He gave us his grace. 
Grace means undeserved favor, undeserved blessing, undeserved favor. So we don't need to feel guilt. We can accept the gift of grace that God holds out to us. And that means that when we sin, we can just come before his throne, we can repent and be made clean and receive that gift of grace. And when we do, that helps us not want to sin again. Embrace grace. And another thing that creates fear in us is believing, hold on a minute, why is God going to bless me? Because I haven't done enough. I don't do anything for God. You know, maybe I haven't served or maybe I should have been doing stuff and I know I'm not doing it and I'm not reading my Bible and I'm not, you know, I don't deserve his blessing. I haven't worked hard enough for it. But the truth is we don't deserve to have God love us, even on our best day. Even on our best day. It's all an act of grace. Ephesians 2.4 says this, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. That phrase, rich in mercy, mercy, uh, sorry, rich in mercy, it's, it's in the Greek, it says plusios and elios. Plusius and Elias, rich in mercy. And that translated means wealthy, having an abundant supply in kindness or goodwill, a willingness to do good, coupled with a desire to help. And what it's saying is, this is God's heart. He's abounding, he's excessive in his desire to do good to you and to show you kindness. That's who he is. That's who your father is. He's not abounding in his desire to punish you. He's, he's abounding in his desire to do good to you and to bless you and to, and, to, and to lavish his kindness on you. Our senior pastor, Pastor George, shared something that I think created such a nice picture. I want to share it with you as well. He said that in 2006, he was having a really difficult time. He was going through a hard time. And he said that he just felt like he was on his own, that God wasn't there helping him. And he was feeling really, really sorry for himself. And he said while he was feeling that, God spoke to him. And these are the words he said that God spoke to him. He, he said, God said, you'd have a better chance of drinking all the waters of the Atlantic Ocean with a straw than you would to bankrupt the mercy of God. Let me say that again. You'd have a better chance of drinking all the waters of the Atlantic Ocean with a straw than you would to bankrupt the mercy of God. And next time you're feeling like that, that, you know, everything's just unfair and God's not doing enough and he's not there and he's not blessing you and he doesn't want to bless you and he's forgotten you, go down to Visag Beach on your way past Beanboard and ask for one of the paper straws that's good for the environment, kneel down and start drinking. And if you can finish, then you can say that you, you, you don't have God's goodness and mercy. You know, it's impossible because that's not who God is. He wants to lavish his goodness and his kindness upon each and every one of us. Galatians 2.21 says this, I do not ignore or nullify the gracious gift of the grace of God, his amazing unmerited favor. For if righteousness comes through observing the law, then Christ died needlessly. His suffering and death would have had no purpose whatsoever. That's the amplified version. It's not about what we do. It's just because of his goodness and his grace. It's just because of his goodness. It's not by our works or by our acts. It's because of his goodness, not because of our goodness. You know, now I'm getting older, I can look back to so many times in my life that I have seen God's grace. I, you know, I was trying to think of some the other day, and, you know, it comes back to me sometimes. I'm, you know, in the supermarket or here or there or wherever I am. It just, sometimes it just hits me, oh, my gosh, that was God's grace. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure all of us know the times when God has lavished his grace on us when we have not deserved it. He's lavished his goodness on us when we have not deserved it. 
And if you haven't found those times yet, take the time to reflect on your life. You know, I remember a time at university, I'd, I knew the Lord, but I still hadn't given my life to God. And God protected me from wrong relationships. He protected me from bad situations. And I really wasn't walking in the way that I should have been walking with God. His favor and his goodness and his grace was upon me. And I just thank God for his grace because I didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve those blessings. But that's our father, isn't it? He's a good father. And he desires to lavish his grace and his goodness on us. And when we understand that, we don't have to be afraid. I didn't deserve this. I don't deserve this. We can just approach his throne and, and we can receive his grace. And when we do that, we, we allow ourselves to unblock those things that prevent us from coming to his throne and we get to receive his blessing. We get to receive his blessing. He is a gracious God. So today I hope we can examine our hearts and see is there anything in our hearts that is holding on to fear? You know, fear because we don't understand fully. We're not ready to believe that he really does see us as his precious son or daughter. Or maybe there's a fear because of things that we're struggling with and we think, I deserve his punishment. I can't stand before him. Maybe we're not really understanding the righteousness that's been given to us. We're too afraid to believe that he could be so good to us. Or maybe we just believe we're just not good enough to deserve his grace. And if that's in your heart, God is really saying, embrace the truth, embrace sonship, embrace righteousness, embrace grace. They were given to you at a cost. It's a dear cost. Embrace it. It's his gift to you. Let's pray. Let's pray. If we bow our heads and pray. Dear God, thank you so much for your goodness to each and every one of us, Lord. Lord, we're so undeserving. And Lord, when I think of everything that you've given us, Lord, everything that you won for us on the cross, Lord, it's too hard to believe sometimes. It's too hard to believe. Lord, that you call us your precious sons and daughters, that you love us like a perfect father, that you have given us the gift of righteousness. You've established us in righteousness, that when you look at us, you see righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, and that it's your desire to lavish your grace and your goodness on us. Lord, take away those fears in our hearts. You know what fears are there, Lord. You know the lies that the enemy has whispered into our ears that we've been holding on to, that we've been believing. That's not from you, Lord. It's not from you. And Lord, let us embrace what is from you, sonship and righteousness and your grace. Lord, continue to convict us, Lord, even as we leave today of what you've given us and what is ours. And let us be able to come before you with confidence, knowing that it's your heart to bless us, Father, so that we can receive every good blessing that you have for our lives, Lord. Lord, this year is a year of blessing. We believe that's your promise to us, Lord. This year we're going to see your blessings, Lord. Lord, teach us how to unblock the amazing blessings that you desire to have flow in each and every one of our lives, Lord. Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. And I just ask if you keep your eyes closed, all heads bowed and eyes closed. And I just want to give you a chance here today. If you haven't yet, placed your trust in Jesus and, you're, and you want to know who is this God who sent his son to die for our sins to take all his sins on him and give us his righteousness instead who loves us so much that he would do that who makes us righteous who calls us into a, a precious relationship with a true and living God and all I have to do is just say yes to Jesus and just believe I don't have to earn it I don't have to work for it I don't have to be perfect I just have to say yes Jesus I believe you did that for me I believe you did that for me well today is a good time for you to just say a prayer I have a prayer and I invite you to say this prayer with me 
that's you, if you want to make this decision, I just ask that you raise your hand and then we're just going to pray a quick prayer together. So I'm going to count to three and I'm going to give you a chance just to raise your hand and we can pray. So if you'd like to welcome Jesus into your heart today, you can raise your hand now. So one, two, three. I'm going to give you another chance. You know, I know sometimes we're scared or we're confused or we're not sure. But you know, God is so good and his love is so amazing. And that's why we come and we celebrate our service every Sunday. And the things that you hear from the word of God, they're true. They're true. God has something amazing for us. And give you another chance if you'd like to raise your hand. You can raise it in one, two, Three. Thank you. Thank you for the hands. I see your hands. You can put them down. And I invite you to say this prayer with me. Dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. Jesus paid the price I should have paid for my sins. But I believe you raised him from the dead and he is alive right now. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me and forgive me. I surrender my whole life to you. Thank you that the Bible says that because of this, I have been born again. Thank you that I can accept the new beginning you want to give me. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have just made that prayer, I want to congratulate you. You have now been welcomed into the kingdom of God. Jesus has come into your heart and he's going to make you new. And there's an amazing journey, adventure ahead just for you. And I want to urge you, I want to advise you, please, we have a free booklet for you at the back. It's called Fresh Choice. Not Fresh Choice. Fresh Start. I'm thinking of a bakery. It's called Fresh Start. And it's free. And it's just at the back. Please take a copy. It's going to help you start walking out your faith with Jesus.